right so uh, we saw that anger was becoming much more frequent then another thing that you see is that fear is also beginning to rise by this age now again one thing that you need to remember is that by six to eight months what is happening in a child's physical development one of the things that's happening is that a child has begun to crawl right now you know around eight months of age children do start to crawl now what does that do again that makes children more autonomous right more independent and it becomes more likely that a child will wander off so at this stage something called stranger anxiety right which is basically children become much more wary of strangers and much more sort of they cling to their caregivers right so stranger anxiety or this fear of strangers right sets in in that they become much more wary of being around people that are new right um at this age as well you know when we talk about attachment so it's very clear this is something that we'll cover later on in our discussion as well um but attachment is something that becomes a uh, much more clear cut right and this brings about another fear which is called separation anxiety so you know if the caregiver is about to leave um that evokes a lot of anxiety in the child a lot of fear in the child you're met with a lot of crying from the child if you're about to leave right so and another thing that's very important here is that infants begin to use familiar caregivers as a secure base for exploration what that means is that you know if you bring a child to a strange setting right the child will explore the room but they'll keep coming back to you um for emotional support and encourage encouragement so you will be their base that they'll come back to you know after every uh, few minutes or so because they're in a strange situation right we'll consider this we'll look into this in much more detail as we talk about um you know the uh, the the bit on attachment right then you have 8 to 12 months what's going on what what is happening here is that an understanding of the meanings of other emotion others emotional expressions improves and social referencing appears now this is something extremely important um there's another thing here that you know there's laughter at subtle elements of surprise so whenever there's surprise there's you know some sort of laughter so also a great age at which you can play peekaboo and you know you have an element of surprise there and children react to that with laughter understanding of the meanings of others emotional expressions improves as well right so children start to understand what other people's expressions mean um and they start doing it in a more effective manner right uh social referencing now what exactly is social referencing social referencing is that you know if a child is in a situation that they do not understand sorry this is i don't think this is the right spelling right uh they are in a situation that they do not fully comprehend what they'll do is that they'll refer to the expressions of their parents right so they'll try to understand something about the situation by reading expressions of caregivers there's a very good video that you can watch for this i will attach the link for that um in which what children are basically you know at this age we've talked about how children start crawling when they're 8 months of age so uh, one of the things that there's an experiment in which they're asked to sort of crawl over this visual cliff and children will do so like you know if they their mothers are smiling at them rather than if the mothers do not show any expression so that is another example of social referencing that basically what they do is that they look towards the caregivers in order to understand the situation better if the caregivers are smiling in a particular situation the children will also start becoming more comfortable in that situation if they feel that the caregiver is upset in that situation the child will also start to be upset right what is happening um in this age range 18 to 24 months 
so you have something which is self-conscious emotions what are self-conscious emotions they are emotions regarding the self right uh, one thing that you need to remember is that during this stage it's when you know children are becoming more self-aware of themselves as you know a distinct person who is different from you know their primary caregivers and when they start feeling that they are a distinct person right so they start experiencing more emotions that are about the self right and these are called self-conscious emotions right um they are embarrassment guilt pride right again you know children are starting to talk around let's say 14 months they're saying first words and then vocabulary for emotion or or words that talk about emotion or describe emotion is increasing very rapidly right there's another thing that's happening is that emotional self regulation is improving right now what do what do these things mean first of all let's talk about self conscious emotions right it's also important to note that you know self conscious emotions that include emotions such as guilt embarrassment shame right are not part of basic emotions right so self conscious emotions um emerge we've said as self awareness increases right and obviously adults you know they work as good guides for what to experience when so these are not just you know negative emotions self conscious emotions can also have or encompass something like pride so if a child accomplishes something for the first time they feel very proud of themselves for having done it right so you know adults also serve as useful guides as to what to experience when in terms of when is it, when is it necessary to experience guilt when is it necessary to experience shame that obviously is driven by the feedback that you receive from your caregivers when is it um, correct to experience pride right so that is something that you develop as a result of feedback from um, the caregivers around you right um there was another term here which talks about how you have self regulation now what exactly is self regulation um self regulation of emotions right it's basically now for example if you're feeling anxious right what do you do you try to you know sort of talk yourself out of it or let's say if you're feeling anxious about the corona virus you say yes it will go away soon we're doing all that we can you know you wash your hands a particular amount of times during the day you know you do not go out too much right and you tell yourself this that i'm doing everything that i can in order to stay safe and it will go away soon right what are you doing you're trying to become less anxious right about this particular pandemic that's out there in the world at present right so in emotional self regulation what you're doing is that whatever emotion is there and it is disturbing you or it is bothering you right you are trying to regulate it right uh, when infants are younger they're not so they they're not as good at self regulation a lot of times you will see that babies if they're stimulated too much they become extremely cranky they start crying right a uh, reason for that is that they're not able to withdraw from or they're not able to regulate their emotions uh, very effectively right they're not able to withdraw when they start to become overwhelmed and that results in basically them having a breakdown like you know they start crying and wailing at the end of it so the reason for that is that at that stage they're not so good at self regulation but by 18 to 24 months of age um which is basically one and a half to two years of age they are becoming much more better at regulating their own emotions right and you also have the emergence of empathy around this stage right which is basically what is empathy empathy is basically that you can understand someone's world view standing in their shoes right 
so walking in someone else's shoes or feeling what they're feeling right um one thing that might not be present at this stage is that you know you might not be children might not be able to convert empathy into sympathy they might become so overwhelmed by the feelings of another that they might you know become sort of um caught up in those emotions themselves so if for example they feel that someone else is feeling sad so they might become um so sad themselves that that feeling of empathy can is unable to translate into sympathy when you feel sympathy for someone then only can you you know sort of act in such a way that uh, you know their misery or whatever that they're going through is um you know you can work in some way to decrease it but with children this age this transition is a lot harder to make right <clears throat> also you know there's this appreciation this is also very important that at this stage there's also this appreciation that others emotional reactions might be different from their own so you know they understand that if for example you know a particular event happens they might feel happy about it but someone else might feel sad about it so that's also you know it's an important realization it's an important milestone in um social emotional development right how do you think that infants um experience emotions so firstly when children are born they are experiencing emotion through something that's called emotional contagion now what exactly is emotional contagion emotional contagion is basically you know for example if you're in the company of someone who's sad constantly so you also start feeling sad right so that is the idea of emotional contagion that emotions you know have a certain degree of contagiousness about them so if you know with and especially this is important when we're considering um you know infants who are born to mothers who do develop some form of postpartum depression that uh you know the possibility of them sort of catching on to those feelings is also possible right so initially it is through emotional contagion right so you know emotional contagion is basically you know sort of catching on to the emotions of others but as perceptual abilities are also increasing right so around 4 months of age so this is basically happening from 0 to 4 let's say months right but four months of age children start to do something which is that you know they start to vocalize and they start to explore the range of their expressions right and then they also expect caregivers you know in these face to face interactions to you know respond to their expressions or respond to their vocalizations right and it's in this interaction that they are also able to understand the range of human expressions right five month on they are able to sort of again we talked about this earlier as well when we were looking at milestones they are able to sort of um, understand other people's emotions as you know structured parts that you know this is happiness this is sadness uh, if they shown the different expressions for these and um the, uh, later on what we see is that 8 month 8 uh, months on they're also able to successfully do something which is called social referencing so by this stage they are very able to they're very much capable of understanding and then working on um what someone else is feeling about a particular phenomena right so yes so if it five months there is recognizing emotions as structured holes right so yes so this is what emotional development looks like um during the first two the first two years of life
In this section, we talk about something that's called temperament. Now, what do you understand when I say the word temperament? We are talking about temperament because, you know, there is considerable research which shows that children are born with particular dispositions to act in, you know, particular ways given um, varying contexts, right? And that is what makes up their temperament, right? So temperament is basically defined as something that is a stable sort of, you know, disposition or not even disposition. So basically what temperament is made up of is these stable, so first of all stable in the sense that it's not that it will vary from one situation to the other, that it will be the same across a variety of situations, right? So stable individual differences across two dimensions, right? And those dimensions are called, so they're stable individual differences in, you know, these two different dimensions, which are called reactivity, right, and responsiveness. So not responsiveness, rather self-regulation, right? So yes, so temperament is defined as, you know, these stable individual differences amongst people in these two dimensions, which are reactivity and self-regulation. Now, what are reactivity and self-regulation? Now, reactivity is basically that, you know, researchers, what they do is that they measure, you know, two different things. So they measure the quickness, right? and the intensity of a variety of things right what are those different you know um, different phenomena that are measured al along these two different dimensions so these are first is emotional arousal right second is motor activity and the third is attention right so basically in order to measure reactivity right what researchers are doing is that they're looking at the quickness and intensity of emotional arousal so if you stimulate a child right how much emotional arousal are they showing right how quickly are they showing it right so intensity measures how much they are showing it and quickness measures how quickly are they showing it right motor activity right what is motor activity physical activity the third is attention right so intensity of att attention and quickness of attention when you have self regulation what are you looking at then <coughs> excuse me and what do we mean when we say what is self-regulation? So self-regulation are basically strategies, right? That control for, that are controlling for the reactivity. Now, what does that mean? So for example, you have let's say very quick emotional arousal right so if you do have this how do you self-regulate how do you lessen this emotional arousal right how do you lessen if there's a lot of intensity or motor activity how do you lessen this right if attention is you know quickly shifting how do you self-regulate that right so all of that and that requires something and you know we'll talk about these two different models when we're talking about temperament but self-regulation, one of those models talks about how self-regulation, right, uh, how self-regulation is a great deal about something that's called effortful control, right? And effortful control is about that, you know, you have basically one strategy, which is a dominant strategy, 
right to you know pursue a particular line of action but what you do is that you reflect on yourself and you replace this dominant strategy for a more adaptive strategy right so let's say if there is a lot of emotional arousal right and that is the dominant strategy according to your temperament right what you do is that you engage in effortful control to suppress this emotional arousal right so you become up with you know a alternate strategy which is more adaptive so this is what self regulation is about let me show you a table so this table basically shows you two different models of temperament right um now here what you can say see is that you know the way that you're measuring um reactivity is that you're looking at ratio of active periods to inactive ones right you're looking at regularity of body functions you're looking at distractibility you're looking at adaptability that you know it's the ease with which child adapts to changes and one of the things that you see is that researchers having used this models right having used this model came up with these three different categories right uh um, in which they classified children in three different classes right so the first of these are the difficult children right these are the children who have a difficult temperament right then there are easy children those who have more easy temperaments and the third is the third is the slow to warm up children and they basically estimated percentages for this so difficult children make up like 10% of the population easy children make up 40% of the population and slow to warm up children make up something like 15% of the population what's important to note here is that this does not add up to 100% which means that there is a you know a whole bunch of children who do not fit into either three of these categories so difficult children are children who basically are they do not form routines very easily right so routine formation is a problem right another thing is that anything that's new so they react to change right in a negative manner so they're very very resistant to any kind of change that change might be in their daily routine that change might be let's say if you've shifted houses so they will react with a lot of crying with a lot of crankiness right so there are two different things here so one is that they do not establish routines very easily so they have very disturbed routines they do not sleep at the same hour each day right they do not eat at the same hour each day and the other thing is that they do not accept change very easily right so this is basically what characterizes difficult children easy children are obviously the opposite of this they you know on the routine front they form routines fairly easily right so they have very stable routines they that they follow that they eat and sleep around the same hour each day right and they are more accepting towards change so they do not react in the same manner or as negatively as difficult children so and you know they so yes easy children just revise they have fairly stable routines and they do not react negatively to change they're fairly more accepting of change right what about the slow to warm up children what about the slow to warm up child children so slow to warm up children are basically you know majorly they show a negative mood and they're mostly inactive right and they show extremely low key reactions and mild reactions to environmental stimuli right so this is what slow to warm up children look like there are further categories as well um that researchers have devised um some of those are 
these are important as well so they're along with the dimensions of inhibited versus uninhibited right children uninhibited or more social children right uh, inhibited children are basically children who withdraw from novel experiences right uninhibited children are much more sociable they do not withdraw as easily i will put up a video in which you'll you know see the difference between these two different kinds of children and you will also look at how stable these characteristics are that you know if children do show a certain amount of reactivity those are very interesting videos if they show a certain amount of reactivity when they're children right what does that say or what does that predict about whether they will be more inhibited later on in life or whether they'll be more uninhibited so that is something that we will look at right but let's go back to this table so this is one model of temperament here right which has all of these different dimensions um using which using which these three different categories of difficult easy and slow to warm up children have been developed then you have this other model of temperament right here sorry that's another difficult child in the background but yes so there's another model of temperament here which is basically looking at reactivity and self regulation right and the way again you're measuring reactivity is that you're looking at level of cross motor activity you're looking at duration of interest so you know the duration of attention you're looking at you know how fearful or distressed is the child in response to a new stimulus you're looking at you know how much do they cry when they are distressed and you're looking at frequency of expression of happiness and pleasure right so you're using these to measure reactivity and the way that you're measuring self regulation is by effortful control which is basically the capacity to voluntarily suppress a dominant reactive response um to you know plan and execute a more adaptive one right so if let's say a child is becoming extremely distressed right so they suppress this instinct to be or they suppress this propensity to be that distressed um and they choose to to you know act in a in a more adaptive fashion right so yes so this is all about temperament next we'll be looking at uh, attachment and self awareness